and I hereby call this meeting to order. Ron, I actually don't have a copy of the agenda in front of me, so could you pop one up, please? Yes, sir. Very good. Actually, I really should get one up. So uh, I would like to know whether anyone would like to make any changes to the uh, minutes from our last meeting. Anyone? No? Okay, well, then we will move on to the RTD draft board dashboard draft recommendations. And uh, so you bring that part up. Good. So Rebecca, I'll let you take it away. Okay. Uh Good afternoon or morning, everyone. Uh, so this is, I think, um, really today to just kind of um, make sure that we're all in agreement uh, with these draft recommendations. This list we talked about last month that Dr. Cog had put together based, I, I think, on the meeting before that, um, talking about the sort of general themes. Um, I think actually the better document to show is one that Natalie and I have been working on that really flushes this out. And I think what I'd propose is, is doing a, a walkthrough of that now, but mm -hmm. it's probably more valuable for the subcommittee to, to have time to read it closely. Um, so maybe we can, I can give the, um, a rough summary and then if uh, chair, if it works for our schedule to provide it as a draft to this group so that we can incorporate any of those kind of finer edits. Could you, uh, could you email that to Ron and then Ron could pop it up? I think Ron has it. Um, Rebecca, you should, you should be able to share your screen if you- Oh, I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> the dreaded share your screen story. I have about 25 tabs open. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's Hold a on. technology rite of passage for all of us to share our screen. Yeah. <sighs> it's so scary. I know because you're afraid like if I share the wrong thing, people will see like my cat. The chaos <laughs> on the stuff. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Perfect. Well. I think I have, you all are seeing probably the 10 year plan, right? How's that? There you go. Whew. I did it. Okay. Um, so this is a more of a narrative form here. Um, again, just picking those, those topic areas. And Natalie, if you're on, I'd sure invite you to, to chime in here. But so recommendation one is really focused on um, making sure that average person um, who's just simply interested in, in sort of understanding RTD's budget has access to a really simple to understand um, explanation. So I think the, the main recommendation here is that a kind of a one sheet budget would be uh, really great to have and put it in an easy, easily accessible place on the RTD website. Um, the area I would love some input on is you, uh, you'll notice here uh, item B, capital project expenditure information. Um, that was a, a carryover from the Dr. Cog list. And I'd love to know from the committee if there's any further thought from the, the folks on, on how we might uh, sort of simply summarize. I could see um, information like that getting, getting very detailed and I wasn't quite sure where to put that particular item. Um, so does anyone, Rudd, I had flagged this for you because I know you've spent so much time with RTD's financials, but any any further thoughts on on if we're if we're ca catching someone off the street and telling them about CDOT's or CDOT RTD's budget, what you were thinking we'd want there? Well, yeah, I, the, the one thing that I had added to it was that uh, document that uh, is called the operations report that shows the financial details line by line 
of all of the lines that are there, all of RTD's rail and, and other lines, uh, the, the value of that is it is often used to decide which rails, which lines get cut or which lines get less support or, or whatever else. And uh, that, that was the one thing that I think that for people who are concerned about uh, why their lines are being cut back, it's, it's really useful to be able to see that. Okay, I think that probably belongs um, more in the fast tracks recommendations then, so. Well, it, it isn't just fast tracks. It's actually uh, for buses and fast tracks. Oh, okay. I heard rail. It's, all it's right. basically for all of RTDs uh, operating. And it get, the, the document itself has pretty good explanations of what's in it. I thought I'd sent something to you on that with a link to it. I'm sure you did. Okay, I'll look back at that and make sure I'm, I'm fully capturing that recommendation there. Great. Okay. I, mean, I may be I may be somewhat um, distorted by the fact that it it has proven to be such a valuable thing for the work that I've been doing. But I think anybody that really wants to dive into the details of of the finances or understand the decisions on cutbacks of of lines that is a really important document. Right. This is Ron. If I, if you don't mind, if I chime in a little bit. Sure. I think specific to that item, it maybe it fits as a uh, sub bullet under item two, the sort of explan explanatory information. I mean that it, you could reference it there, Rebecca. And then as as the finance components of the dashboard and the operational components of the dashboard that the operations committee is exploring, that that document can also fit there. So I, I think you know. I, I hear, I hear Russ recommendation for some reference to that, to the um, service performance document and maybe some latitude, maybe it fits here, maybe it ultimately fits in the operations piece. I don't know, but maybe some latitude to figure out the best way as we put you know, the recommendations together. Does that make sense? Sometimes it doesn't hurt to have it in both places if there are two places where it's relevant. For sure. I mean, it just doesn't take any extra effort to really do that, so why not? Thank you, Ron, that was helpful. Well, does anyone disagree with the value of a, um, just to keep us on one for a second, on the value of having a kind of a one sheet, simple budget? Of having a what? A one sheet. One sheet. Yeah, I'm, I'm enthused. I, I strongly believe that the average human being is not gonna be able to look at that budget and really understand what they're seeing in detail. Even people with financial backgrounds, there's just, there's the issue of terminology, you know, what's what's base, what's fast tracks project, and what's fast tracks operations, for example. But I, there's other terminology that most people wouldn't necessarily be familiar with. I think you raised a good point, Rut, that a one pager is helpful just because we want to make this accessible and digestible to the public, but terms will need to be defined. So right, uh, RTD talks about categories in a certain language, helping mm -hmm. people understand what's in them, which is easy to do on the, you know, the web because you can have a definition on a link sitting behind every term. But I, I do think it would be easy enough for them to focus group with members of the public to say, does this make sense to you? And, and that's, that's one really other thing, cool. speaking of focus groups, a great point that you raised that, Elise, because they, they really shouldn't get together and figure out what this needs to be and then, and then stick it on their website. They really need to get together with groups that use this kind of data and other, other folks like that. So uh, to focus group it, do a legitimate focus group on it. Brett, can I uh, throw out uh, suggestion in. Absolutely, Dan. Um, when we were going for a property tax election, uh, I found some great animated videos on the Gallagher Amendment. And, you know, just a, kind of a short few minute uh, animated video 
that explains the budgeting process, where the revenues come from, how uh, those flow into services and capital projects and so forth. Might be better in some ways, or might be helpful in addition to you know, one pagers and other documents that might go on the website. Yeah, I've learned in the modern world, videos seem to have grown very popular, <laughs> no matter what domain you're working in. I think I just heard a TikTok recommendation. <laughs> yeah, that's how my teenager learns everything. Right. Yeah, especially if you dance rat, I, you get my views. <laughs> oh my God. Just letting you know, that's how that works. Yeah, we guarantee that no one ever watched that video. I think that's a, a great ad. Can I ask, I, um, a couple of folks have mentioned a focus group. I, I tend to agree with that. I think that could be a standalone recommendation here that this mm -hmm. is our, our best um, input as a, a committee who's actually had the value of spending about a year on this. But I think a focus group for getting further input on, on building out these kind of dashboards could be a lot of value. Right. I'll make that a standalone recommendation. Is that anyone disagree with that? Here by hearing no disagreement, we'll assume that's a good idea. Okay, so I'll make that kind of the, the top recommendation, but I guess then moving us into two um, would be, so I, I would see sort of that number one recommendation as you wanna just spend one minute getting an idea of the RTD budget. Item two is you have a little bit more time. And so this would be more of an explanatory document that would define a lot of these sort of RTD terms of art or transit term of art, like base system and fare box revenue, but also talk through um, how, um, sort of like uh, how, the, how a bill becomes a law, if we all remember our TV from a long time ago, um, but talk about the RTD budget adoption process, how the, uh, the board interacts with that, just a really simple explanation and then C, again, refers, I think, back to some of the work our operations group and DEA is doing on explaining how the budget aligns with RTD's mission and performance objectives. Um, and then I think here is a, a place on the site where we could um, reference that document, Rhett, that you talked about that's been really valuable. Right, and, and uh, just to emphasize, uh, this needs to be something that we, you know, DEA needs to have veto power over, over the sorts of things that we're talking about as well. I don't think there's anything here that, uh, that you would have concerns about, but I can't always speak for DEA <laughs> and wouldn't, wouldn't presume to. But um, yeah, it, it's always a little trickier when it's you know multiple coming from multiple places. But I mean, operations has had some really good ideas too and blending all of this stuff together is gonna be uh, critical. Yep. All right. Any additional input here? Okay. So the, the third recommendation here really focuses on fast tracks. Um, you can see here the text acknowledges the a fair amount of um, public interest and media um, scrutiny on this area of the RTD system in particular. Um, I thought the Fast Track website was really well done, but what it doesn't have is that connection um, to the budget. Uh, no, no explanation that I could find of, of FISA and the role that that will play in, in building out the, the rest of the system. So I, again, I think this could be an area a focus group could help with, um, but I wanted to, to flush, flush out a recommendation here in particular that looked at fast track. Any input here? I think that the average RTD user doesn't really know there is a fast tracks and that there's also this other thing called base and you know, just getting them to the point where they understand those kind of details is pretty critical. The other thing I've found when I've talked to people is that people think that their fare pays the cost of the ride. And it's really important that they understand that those rides are 
heavily supported by the tax dollars that go to fast tracks and that go to base. Mm, that's a good point. You know, they, they think that, you know, for two bucks or three bucks, that's, that's what it costs to get from A to B. And as we all know, it's quite a different story. I do think it's helpful to explain FISA a little bit just because that term is coming up more frequently and will probably continue as that accounts tapped into to do the fast tracks or the Northwest Rail feasibility analysis. Agree. So it's worth explaining what it is and what's in it, how much money's in it. Not as much as one might think. All right. Uh, the fourth recommendation, which would actually be the fifth if the first one becomes the um, a focus group, but this is, this is a more specific recommendation on the federal stimulus dollars. Um, so really do want some input here. Our group has already given some guidance on I think the first two allocations. We talked, I think last meeting about modifying those recommendations somewhat given that a third allotment is coming. Um, so, but, but part of this recommendation suggests that RTD provide kind of a full accounting, uh, looking backwards once all those funds are, have been received to show the public how they were spent. Um, and then also to just continue to share its priorities for um, particularly the third allotment as it's not been received yet. Uh, fully aware that RTD is still waiting on guidance from the, um, uh, at the FTA on those funds and appreciate that. Um, but I think our committee has just talked about the importance of, of expressing to the public and stakeholders um, how these dollars would be used generally, knowing that there will be some restrictions, but it's also uh, been a little bit predictable how um, FTA wants to see those dollars spent. So that's what this recommendation is meant to say. Again, we'll all uh, develop this one a bit more uh, anything to add here? Yeah, I, I wanted to add that uh, most or a lot of people, especially in the first CARES part, they really did not understand that the, that the use of those funds really is pr pretty narrowly restricted. And for example, we can't build the Northwest Rail with money out of the CARES fund. So there needs to be an understanding of how restrictive it is and what it can and can't be used for it. Because I think a lot of times people don't understand uh, why they were used the way they were used. And sometimes they don't understand that because they don't understand the restrictions on it. And to be fair to RTD, uh, people should have, have, a not, have an understanding of that. I think that's a good point. And I would just add again that um, RTD's response on how it spend, has spent funding to date, I don't think is understandable to the average person um, that's not familiar with RTD terminology yeah. around sort of how it characterizes its staff. And I think, again, this is a place where it would be useful to do sort of the the um, real, real world focus group test on, do you understand that we spent, you know, it, it, these limited dollars that were restricted for this on, you know, staff at this level and just to make sure that it's pretty crystal clear because I think if somebody reads an explanation and can't understand it, it has a negative impact on, on government transparency and trust because it, 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 it's meaningless and it looks, I, I don't know, it reinforces bad um, views of government that, uh, and anyway, so enough said. And, and I, the other part of that is once they get to something like that, they get that feeling that, oh, this is just a bunch of, and then they click another window. So, um, and it's usually not a window on our app. RTD's app. So it, 
your point is, is really a, an important one and a really hard thing to do for whoever's going to be building this. That's a really good point. Okay, that's, that's, that's this document. Um, I think what I'd suggest is to uh, take these notes and input today, uh, expand this a bit more, add the focus group, and then uh, share it uh, with the subcommittee chair. And um, maybe ask for a turnaround in a week's time or, <laughs> or sooner. I, I'm not sure uh, what deadline we're driving to right now. I was just starting to say I can't, you know, speak overall on, on all the particulars, but I think, you know, the board has been pushing in staff towards more uh, transparency and, and these seem like a real good way to go. Um, I know Doug McLeod is on the call. I don't know if he has anything to add, but um, uh, this, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of good thought here. Thank you, Director Geisinger. Yeah, this is Doug McLeod, and I, I totally agree. This is a great direction, and I think um, it will really serve the public well. I know that um, we've struggled with some of the reports that we put out there and having them be understandable, but absolutely, this is a, a great direction, and um, I'm all for it. Um. Brett and Rebecca, so in terms of time frame, we have one more subcommittee meeting after this in two weeks, two weeks okay. from today. So that would be the last opportunity for the subcommittee to sort of gavel down on, on, on the recommendation to go to the, the full accountability committee. Yeah, That's we really are, are uh, coming under the gun on our time. Cool. And so just to support Ron and what he said, we really got to get this done. We're going to have a lot of things to approve or disapprove in two weeks. And that, of course, is not the final approval. That's just us passing it on to the, to the committee that's as a whole. That's correct. Okay. I, I think that's completely workable. I'll, I'll do some work on my end to get this turned around. We'll share it so that folks can read the full narrative um, and hopefully have a, a pretty quick approval of it at our next meeting. Hey, Ron, we've been going through a variety of different Zoom type apps and I can't figure out how to see all the people that are in the meeting. So <laughs> right at the, at the upper right corner of your screen, there should be a button that says view. Yes. If you click on that, choose the gallery view gallery view in the upper right okay right now i'm seeing just the ron pap store part yep so there's you click, everybody hiding underneath good so if you click on the view button and then and then move your cursor down to gallery and choose gallery you should be able to see everyone good i can now okay for reasons i don't understand but i can now so i'll take it Okay, what is the next item on the agenda? That would be uh, Northwest Rail. Yep. All right, let me, let me start by saying one of the worst things to have to talk about are financial details of, of things like Northwest Rail. I know it's, you know, it's not, particularly exciting, but it really is a critical issue because I, you know, ever since I started working on this, I've really had this feeling that Northwest Rail could sink RTD, that it, it's just such a colossus. And, uh, and I don't, I have never been able to get a good explanation of how we could possibly afford uh, to build that out. Uh, under given all of the financial constraints that we're that we're in, at the same time, I really feel like when I look at when I've looked at at the economics of Flatiron Flyer and BRT in general, it it really is a great opportunity to be able to provide better services at a lower cost. In fact, better services than we might be able to with just the train. 
And so um, what I've tried to do is I've tried to put together uh, a PowerPoint that says, okay, here's, here's the path we're on right now with Northwest Rail. And then here's what we could do if we went to an expansion of BRT across the region as an alternative. And so that's what, that's what I would like to uh, talk about today. And uh, if you can suffer through a PowerPoint of mine, which is not one of the most beautiful things, uh, we'll, be able to, we'll be able to, I think, have a better understanding of this. But I really do think there's a great opportunity here to provide more and better services uh, through BRT. So with that, Ron, I'm gonna bring up the PowerPoint. It's a lot of word slides, I'm afraid, but it's fascinating stuff for someone who's been pouring over it like I have. Oh, there we go. You'll see the side of my face because I've got a screen over here that I have this on. So let me um, start by going back to our original uh, committee assignments from the governor and the legislature. And one of the key things is how can RTD achieve long-term financial stability and growth while still meeting its core mission? And that is, that's really from the finance committee's perspective, what it's all about. Uh, because I, I really do think that there are some real risk here that, and I think there's a path around them as well. So the governor says, clearly it's, you know, in, in the legislature, 20 years out is really not an option from their perspective. And I think that, that bus rapid transit can deliver on those 2004 fast tracks promises, particularly for the Northwest Corridor. Uh, and it can do that in a lot less than the time scales that we were previously under. Uh, Ron, next slide. So um, here, here's the path that we seem to be going down. And I encourage anybody to correct me if I'm, if I'm off on this, but it's a partnership basically with Front Range Passenger Rail and Amtrak and then Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which owns all the right of way that we would have to access. RTD, of course, CDOT, uh, FRA, TRA, Federal Railroad uh, and Federal Transit uh, agencies. And then the Army Corps of Engineers and local communities as well. Um, those are a lot of partners to have. Northwest rail route as a validation test. This is one of the things I got by talking to one of the, um, by the vice chair over at uh, Front Range Passenger Rail is, it's possible that that whole Northwest rail segment could be, okay, let's see how we are gonna do this. And the encouragement there that I gave and that he had was what if we took Northwest rail and built that out first and really tried to figure out what the, challenges and all that work. And that's assuming that somehow the money comes through. Um, but it could be a validation test. Burlington Northern Santa Fe owns a right of way. They currently run 10 to 17 freight trains a day. Uh, those tracks are older, slower, 45 mile an hour kind of speed tracks for the most part. Um, and it's a single track. All of that whole strip uh, going up pretty far north is just one track. And so one track is, is not gonna work for all of the things that we're talking about trying to do. So Burlington Northern Santa Fe is basically looking at going from single track to dual track, higher speed track, siding stations, railroad crossings, uh, lease, and then leasing those back to Amtrak and RTD at a price to be negotiated. And we run into this problem before Four in some of the original work because it turned out the price to be negotiated was pretty high on Northwest Rail. So uh, we'll have to see how all that, all that winds up rolling out. But um, they are the people that really know how to build railroads, uh, railroad tracks. And so it makes sense to work with them. They own the right of way, so that's it. Um, and the RTD just approved this uh, thing called a peak service study. And uh, uh, just to be clear, that is not 
Northwest Rail. It is, it is and it's not building the peak, uh, peak service. It's just let's understand it. A lot of things that we may learn from that study will be applicable to some of the challenges that we'd have with peak, with uh, Northwest Rail. So uh, maybe a good thing to do, uh, you know, at $708 million for 800 ridership on uh, this peak service, I, I, I have said before, I'm not convinced that that is the best way to, to the best idea to do. But that aside, there's a lot we can learn from this whole thing. Peak service means three mornings, three trips in the morning, one way to, you know, uh, and then in the evening, three trips back. So Longmont to Denver and then Denver to Longmont. Uh, let's go to the next one. These are all diesel locomotive uh, pulling coaches. Uh, and for that matter, so is Northwest Rail in the current uh, plan. So the study is, is to look at, and this was sort of the middle of three options in the study. Uh, it's about five to $8 million. Um, and it is uh, sort of initial planning, looking at environmental linkages and issues that are gonna come up, uh, vehicle technology and, and uh, other kinds of impacts. And the, the funding is probably gonna come from the FISA account. Uh, and the timeline is about 18 to 24 months, but I think they're talking about really once having all their ducks in a row and really starting at the end of this year. It's probably about you know late 2023, early 2024 to be able to finish finish this part. After this is done, then there's a second level of stuff that was included in option three that they provided. But that's the real full-blown environmental impact statement study and getting approval for that and a whole lot of other engineering and project developments. Uncertain how long, how long that part might take. Ron? Yeah, it is, this is only the peak morning, evening, three train, single track service and not the full project, which I think I accidentally said in the last slide. So this is more of the whole Northwest rail implementation. And this was a slide uh, that, that uh, I borrowed from RTD. And as you can see, it's complicated. There are a lot of moving parts here. There are a lot of different components. Um, you know, you look at things like just will of the people over there on the end. That takes a lot of time to meet with all the groups that are impacted by this and figure out, you know, what's what's needed in order to try to satisfy that and to try to deal with some of the promises that were made in 2004. <clears throat> so here's the, here's the recommendation in a nutshell. When you look at all the operational and economic and political and environmental complexity and risk that's involved in Northwest Rail, uh, the recommendation that I think that, that the committee, the RTD accountability should make is that they should really consider the alternative of a rapid uh, uh, BRT expansion. At the same time, let the whole Northwest Rail thing continue to go on, support that, look at that. But rather than waiting for all of those things to, to planets to align, go after the what we can do with BRT because I think there are some things we can do at a reasonable price there. So there's six claims that I will make about BRT versus Northwest Rail. The first one being that the BRT solution can deliver services much sooner than we would get with Northwest Rail, and, and that matters. Uh, BRT solution can also better accommodate future growth than, than the rail lines can. BRT solution is less expensive to maintain and less expensive to implement than Northwest Rail. And a BRT solution is far less expensive per boarding than commuter rail lines. And this is, there's data to, to support that, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, and then a BRT solution is also less of a threat to the future financial sustainability of RTD than Northwest Rail would be. And that is one of our key uh, items from the uh, governor and from the legislature. 
So can a BRT solution deliver services over a decade sooner than Northwest Rail? Well, the Flatiron BRT, Flatiron Flyer, uh, has provided already twice the service in terms of boardings uh, than has been promised for Northwest Rail. I don't think a lot of people realize that. It opened in January 2016. It's been operating for some years. And in 2016 alone, it provided 3.366 million boardings and rides along that Boulder Denver US 36 route. The goal of Northwest Rail is 5,400 weekly boardings by 2035. And there's this odd little formula that I use to, to adjust that to annual boardings. And it's basically, you got five weekdays. They always refer to the number of boardings by weekdays on the weekends. And I got some data to support this from, from, uh, our, from RTD. They were really were very responsive in getting me this day, but it's about the same. It's about a half the boardings on a Saturday or Sunday that there is on a weekday because everybody's using it for getting to work and things like that. So anyway, that equates, that 5,400 equates to about 1.7 million boardings per year. That's half of what uh, the Flatiron Flyer did in 2016. And it's also very possible to expand what the Flatiron Flyer did at a relatively low cost. So <clears throat> the question is, can it support can it better accommodate future growth than Northwest Rail? And I'll show you some of the reasons why I really do think that it can, it can. So that would be in, on a future slide. Go ahead, Ron. All right. <clears throat> so for starters, the Flatiron Flyer right now is operating only three of the routes that it was operating. Four of the routes have been suspended, temporarily suspended until after the pandemic. So there's automatically, you know, by bringing just the existing routes we were, we were running before back, and I assume some of these buses are probably in storage too, uh, but just bringing that back, we've hired a lot of the people, a lot of the operators back. So if you looked at how you could bring back the Flatiron Flyer in a reasonable period of time, I think it's quite practical to do that. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Ron. And if you look at the losses we've had with pandemic ridership, all those people are not immediately gonna go back to using transit. And so there's this period of time where we're gonna be building that ridership back up and it's not gonna happen overnight. So if we look at restoring Flatiron Flyer to its previous levels, that'll happen while hopefully we're winning these people back to transit. And so it's kind of a natural connection, but the solution to that is you don't wait until all those people are back before you start doing the restoration, especially if you wanna to try to be able to take also some of that anticipated ridership that they might otherwise have gotten from, from the trains. Doubling the bus frequency, it's, this is the other thing about it. If you look at, at the idea of doubling the bus frequency, the impact on US 36 traffic is actually uh, not, not bad at all. In fact, it's positive because you get more people on buses and fewer people driving cars. Uh, so adding on the capacity that is that Northwest Rail is being built to support, which is 5,400 riders, that would just be a 50% increase in what we were doing already in 2016 with the Flatiron Flyer. So I think uh, if we go to the next slide, here's, here's the idea of the doubling. The, the highest frequency of any of the lines is the, has been the Boulder Denver Express line, which is one of the things that makes it popular. You can just sort of show up and any time in 10 minutes, there's gonna be another, another train, another bus. If you look at what happens there, even at that really tight frequency, in 10 minutes, that bus is 10 miles down the road that just left the station. So when the next one's up, you're already 10 miles away from having a bus on 
uh, on 36. 60 miles an hour, 10 minutes, which is a sixth of an hour, works out to 10 miles. <laughs> At a five minutes frequency, it's five miles down the road. And so the ability to expand that is, is re without really having a big clog on US 36 is, is really pretty straightforward. Now, that doesn't mean you have enough buses to do that, but you could gradually do some of these things as, as the demand merited it. You don't have to just say, all right, I'm gonna lay this out and say, all right, I wanna have support on this rail line of 5,400 people on a weekday. What's it gonna take? And then work back from that. In this case, it's really demand driven. You see what's happening and then you adjust appropriately. So these buses, basically, if they're in managed lanes, they're reducing congestion rather than adding to it because they've got more people than the single occupancy vehicle in the other lanes or the three plus uh, folks in a car in that lane. The bus frequency basically then is, is gradually adjusted and it really predict, uh, it really avoids some of that challenge of trying to predict ridership. You just grow it, you grow it organically. So what's the impact on the Northwest corridor? This is the rail side. You're, you're really talking about if you want a 30 minute peak, 60 minute off peak rail service, <clears throat> that's 23 round trips. That's adding 46 additional trains per day on that corridor. And, um, and there's also, you know, could you do it more often than 30 minutes? There's a thing called a throat uh, in terms of how many trains you can turn around in what period of time. And, and according to one of the other uh, RTD slides I saw, it's that Union Station throat is probably about a 30 minute frequency. So you couldn't get less than that uh, with a train, which you can with BRT. So this is that 46 additional trains, that's an addition to the 10 to 17 Burlington Northern Santa Fe freight trains plus whatever, if Amtrak does make this deal, however many trains they're gonna wanna run. Initially, it would be just three round trips a day, but I think their ambition is to have much more regular service up and down the, up and down the uh, front range. So the other thing you've gotta have then is you've gotta have managed rail crossings and you're gonna need more of those and, and they tend to be a safety issue you know, if you look at some of the worst accidents you see with rail, it's when somebody's trying to beat the train. Um, but aside from that, it's also delays and it's noise in those communities. I mean, 46 additional trains, one of the slides I saw said 55, but I did the math, I think it's 46. That's a lot of trains that you're adding to those, to that area, not just to the rails, but also just the impact they have on people trying to get to work. You know how you pull up and the bar goes down and you're sitting there waiting to be able to get across the crossing. So building out the new dual rail tracks, that's a, that's a pretty disruptive process as well. And, and it's gonna have a very adverse air quality impact when you've got all those diesel trucks tearing up the ground and <clears throat> doing all the things they need to do in order to get the job done. So why does a BRT solution cost a lot less than maintaining uh, Northwest Rail? Well, the answer is RTD doesn't maintain it. It's, it's CDOT that built those lanes. And essentially we're piggybacking on CDOT to get the advantage of that. They, they uh, uh, basically, uh, look at RTD's buses and say, this is a good thing. This is why we built managed lanes. We're gonna get more people through this, through this US 36 corridor. So it's really a win-win. It's one of those rare things you can find in this whole thing that, that truly is a win-win. So why does it cost far less to implement the North, Northwest Rail? And it's because we don't have to build any rails. We basically use those managed lanes. And that's what we've been doing with, uh, uh, with the Flatiron Flyer. And it's why the Flatiron Flyer has been so inexpensive relative to the kind of uh, commuter rail that we're talking about for Northwest Rail. So the capital cost of the lanes 
was paid by CDOT. And, uh, and the shared resources, the fact that it's not just for RTD, it's for all of the people who are gonna have three people in their car. And it's for all of the people that are willing to pay the fees to ride in that lane. So it is a shared resource, which is why it makes sense for CDOT to build it and to pay for it as a way of relief, relieving congestion, but also why RTD can capitalize on that. So does a BRT solution cost far less to implement? Well, obviously it does if CDOT's picking up the tab on what would otherwise be the rails, but in this case is a resource that everyone's gonna benefit from. Uh, and, and it can be expanded over time. In, uh, we, we will need, for example, of stations. If this really works out well, we're gonna have more people than we originally planned for. So there'll be cost in expanding stations, but you don't have to do it all at one time. You can find out which stations are getting a lot more demand and just focus on those. The other thing is the savings that we get from this can fund some first last mile services to increase transit ridership. So if you look at, if you look at money uh, that's spent by the state or spent by the federal government, you always wanna look at the places where you can get the greatest impact. And I think that first last mile is one of the best returns on investment that we can get out of this whole thing. So what about Longmont? We've been talking about US 36. Well, it doesn't go to Longmont. So there's, this is not, you know, this is something a lot of people have worked on for a long time. And I'm basically just piggybacking on the work of a lot of other people. Uh, I'm no Einstein, but Einstein said that he saw as far as he did because he stood on the shoulders of giants. And, and that Northwest uh, uh, study group really, I think, did a terrific job of looking at some of these issues and how they can be addressed. So I, a lot of this is work of other people. So please don't get the impression I'm trying to take credit for it. But there is this, uh, this American Jobs Plan Act for infrastructure funding. And it would make a lot of sense to focus on getting this, this State Highway 119 really shovel ready for when those funds start to become available. And um, right now there's something like $150 million that, in commitments. The whole project here is something like $250 million. And so there's still money that we need, but if we can show that kind of commitment from local agencies within the state, I think we stand a really good chance of getting that funding from the federal government. Um, <clears throat> what was that last comment on the slide, Ron? You're getting ahead of me here. I appreciate that. The, the key to this is it really has to get a high implementation priority uh, from state government, uh, from the CDOT side, from the RTD side, and also from all of the communities that are impacted by decisions like this. But if it got that, this could be, you know, the ribbon cutting could be in the next three to four years. And that's a whole lot better than what we think we're gonna be. We won't be through the initial studies by three to four years on Northwest Rail. All right, Ron, please. <laughs> Ridership is the key to success. If you, if you read the legislation that is on the governor's desk, the new measure of RTD will not be fare box ratios, which are odd ducks anyway that few people understand and can be manipulated a little bit. Ridership's pretty clear measure. And that's what mass transit exists for. If you've got a mass transit agency that's not delivering ridership, you don't have a very good mass transit agency. And so having that as the, as the measuring stick for the success of RTD, I think is a, is a real major improvement. Um, I probably am prejudiced by the fact that Lisa and I were both involved in that quite a bit along the way. So um, if you look at, at the idea of how we build ridership, and this is something that, uh, that I've, I put some time into and hopefully I'm gonna have ready for the next committee meeting. Uh, 
is, is this idea of these gathering networks where you basically run cars around the outside and people can come over. You know, if you have an app and you can see where the cars are and where they're coming or buses that are picking you up to take you to uh, where you get on this uh, uh, larger network, uh, US, whether it's US 36, in this case, this particular example is Longmont. And in Longmont, you're basically going around these loops and people can, within a few blocks, uh, walk down and, and grab one of these buses and, and get to the point where they're on the, uh, they're on the main uh, BRT. So that's something I think that, that is a good investment and something hopefully we'll look at and find an effective way to do it. Next slide. And here are some other BRTs. Uh, I sat in on a meeting of the US 287 BRT group, and I know there's uh, activity on seven, Highway 7 as well. Uh, these are not as uh, simple projects as, for example, the one for, um, for I don't want to call it simple, but uh, 119, you know, the diagonal highway. That one is, is not as congested as some of these other ones. So there are challenges, but, uh, but I think that it's worth looking at, at the issue of BRTs in a, larger, in a larger sphere for that whole corridor and where we could have effective ones. I know there are already some, you know, see the little green bus line down here just above Louisville. That's a sort of a gathering uh, place for uh, picking up people from Lafayette, Louisville, Louisville and, and Broomfield. Anyway, next slide. So why is Northwest Rail so expensive? Well, a lot of people don't realize how long Northwest Rail is. The length of that Northwest Rail plan, it's 45% of the length of all the other fast track rail lines combined. And, and it was also very late, it's supposed to be finished by 2015. Well, things get more expensive with time, especially when you're talking about construction materials. The cost to use that right of way was a lot higher than they expected when they first did this. And, um, and the Federal Railroad Administration also in 20, 2006 said, this really needs to be commuter rail. Well, it needs to be commuter rail. It's a whole lot more expensive than uh, running light rail lines. The 2004 estimate of $565 million uh, is gonna be more than tripled by this time this thing finally completes. So when is RTD gonna have a billion and a half dollars to spend on Northwest Rail? Well, I do look at budgets a lot and I, I just can't see where that's gonna come from. Um, and, and the people in the other unfinished corridors, three other unfinished corridors, they're not real happy that the squeaky wheel is likely to get all the grease on this. Uh, I think everybody feels like they, they have some needs, especially these other three corridors. It's not as big a problem as Northwest Rail is, and, and, but they'd like some attention too. And that means money in the end. So, all right. So, are BRT solutions far less expensive per board boarding than commuter rail lines like Northwest Rail. This is one of the claims that I made at the very beginning of this discussion. But we got data on it. You know, the, the, the big thing is we're using managed lanes instead of having to build rail. rail. The 2016 cost per, per boarding, you know, what they call subsidies in that report, per boarding on the Flatiron Flyer was $4.94. And that is a remarkably no, low number. Um, if you look at the existing computer rail lines, line A, B, and G, and these aren't nearly as long. I think A is the one that even comes close. It's about half the length of, of uh, line B, Northwest Rail. The average cost per boarding on those lines was about $18. And compare that to the $4.94, it's just inherently a lot more expensive. 
a, a BRT like Flatiron Flyer, which has been really well managed, I got to say, that one uh, basically is about a quarter of the cost of, of commuter rail. Less, it would, if you, if you really looked at how long that rail line is and what it's going to cost and all the other factors, compared to line B, it would be a lot less than a quarter of the cost. So I, I did a little thought experiment here and I said, what if the BRT's 3.366 million boardings were commuter rail? Uh, what would they have cost? Even at the computer rail rates, that $18, which is probably lower than it would be for, for um, the line B. If those had been the cost, if you look at the, the amount of money that we would already pay, the $4.94, the difference between that and the $18 would add a $44 million expense on RTD every year. And I don't, you know, having looked at their budgets pretty hard, I'm not real sure where $44 million a year comes out to, to do that. Also, Northwest Rail is, is 45, I think I mentioned that, 45% of the length of all the other rails. So it will inherently cost more than those other, uh, those other rail lines. So next slide. So is BRT a solution? Far less <clears throat> is BRT is a bleh, BRT solution far less of a threat to the future of financial sustainability of RTD than Northwest Rail. And um, unless all, I, I haven't played the game. Okay, what if all of the capital cost of Northwest Rail were provided by the federal government or a magic genie or wherever else you find $1.5 billion, I don't know. Um, if it came from somewhere else, there's still expenses. The, the operating expenses, operating and maintenance expenses on Northwest Rail are estimated to be $20.6 million. Fortunately, if we use BRT and we're piggybacking on our friends at, at uh, uh, CDOT, then a lot of that expense we don't have. The principal, there's a, there are still expenses. You got to maintain your buses and things like that. You got to maintain your rail cars too. So if you look at principal and 2% interest payments on $1.5 billion, it's $80 million a year just for principal and interest. And we already have quite a bit of that that we're paying. In fact, there's 152 million of debt payments uh, just in the... Uh, the modified final 2020 budget. So, you know, if, if you look at our sales and use tax revenue, that was about $200 million. So we're, you know, we, when you say sustainable, you've really got to figure out how you can do things that, that you're going to be able to pay for in the year that your revenues are coming in. Even if all the capital cost of Northwest Rail were federally funded, it, it's just really not clear to me where that other $20.6 million is coming from either. Much less our ability to address all the other, um, the other three unfinished corridors. So here are the six claims that support a decision to rapidly expand our BRT services. And this was what I started with. The, the solutions can be delivered a decade sooner than Northwest Rail. Well, they're already being in some parts delivered. This doesn't handle all of the other communities that we're not necessarily reaching. It certainly doesn't solve the Longmont uh, problem, but there is a way to get there on the Longmont problem. And it's, I don't wanna say cheap, but cheap relative to $1.5 billion. A BRT solution can better accommodate the future growth than Northwest Rail. You know, we're just looking at the problem right now, but most of the growth, most of the population of Colorado is along the front range. A lot of it's Denver, Boulder, and the growth in Denver and Boulder has been higher certainly than most of the rest of the state. A BRT solution is far less expensive to maintain than Northwest Rail. You just got to Maintain your buses. You don't have to maintain your infrastructure. 
and far less expensive to implement than Northwest Rail. And the BRT solution is less expensive per boarding than commuter rail lines, which Northwest Rail will be a commuter rail line. And then finally, the BRT solution is a lot less of a threat to the future sustainability of RTD than Northwest Rail. Someday we will get out from under all of this debt that we have created to build out all of these rail lines, but it's not gonna happen in, in the next 10 or 20 years, maybe 20, we'll start to get there. So closing note, um, while the financial and operational analyses like these, they just don't make for great reading. I appreciate that. <laughs> Many of you have given me your thoughts on the stuff that was distributed in the last meeting. But their understanding is really essential to RTD's ability to deliver transit services to Colorado. And, and we're gonna need those services to be able to grow and thrive in the coming years. Budgets are very much moral documents. And unless RTD is financially sustainable, the impact of that if on all those people that are living paycheck to paycheck, well, that paycheck's not gonna be there anymore. Families are gonna suffer you know, small and large businesses uh, that are dependent on a stable workforce, um, they're either gonna fail or they're gonna leave the state. This is really, this stuff really matters. I know it can be a little boring sometimes, but I gotta tell you, we really need to find a meaningful solution to this that, that's gonna ensure RTD for the long term. And, and in this, when we do send this recommendation, we really need RTD to review this analysis. Find flaws, tell me I'm wrong about this. You know, I've, I've asked other people to do that. I, I have certainly improved it a lot from feedback from other people, but I think these numbers are pretty, pretty reliable. And there's a good path forward here for us. And so I hope it'll, it'll be seriously considered as one of the recommendations for, uh, for our committee. Hey, we're still in time. <laughs> so I eagerly welcome comments from anybody in our group. That's what I thought. Elise. So uh, I'll jump in since this is an area uh, near and dear to our heart. I appreciate all of the time and effort and learning that you're doing on this rut. I, I guess a, a couple of things. I think it's helpful to remember that in case it's not obvious that the Northwest Corridor was promised Northwest Rail and US 36 BRT. So the US 36 BRT is the part that has been delivered. Mm -hmm. Northwest Rail isn't. And they were getting, the air is getting both because while there is certainly an overlap in some of the ridership, they are two distinct um, alignments. And one, for example, goes through, you know, downtown Louisville serves Longmont, that would be the Northwest Trail that hasn't been built. Flatiron Flyer um, serves different communities and, and, and terminates in Boulder. So um, I think that the utility of, of the Flatiron Flyer for this is to set a shining example of what BRT can mean throughout the metro area as a um, model for truly multimodal, high ridership. It's not classic BRT in terms of um, you know, European or, you know, other types of BRT, but it's the closest we have and it works remarkably well. And so I think it's useful to hold up as a, 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 an opportunity, both within the Northwest Corridor and, you know, on Colfax and other places. It's, it's, it's a good example. Um, but I guess a couple of things. You, certainly the, the potential of BRT is, has been understood um, that's why the Northwest, Northwest Area Mobility Study said, hey, while we're waiting for Northwest right. Rail, let's keep providing some cheaper um, mobility throughout the region. So that's why those corridors are moving forward, not as fast as they should be. Um, but one thing that you highlighted is they're not all RTD, right? Because they are transit on a highway, they're a partnership with CDOT as well. And that creates new partnerships and opportunities and funding streams. 
um, that are really essential. And again, not <clears throat> Northwest corridor specific. That's something that the entire doc, the, the entire RGD region can learn and, and emulate. Um, your whole point that that um, BRT would be a, a more cost effective mobility option than Northwest Rail. Um, that is a conversation that the region needs to have. Um, and I don't think, so I appreciate the analysis and we may wanna hold that up as, hey, this is food for thought for RTD and the region. But ultimately um, what we need to queue up is, this is Elise speaking as my recommendation for our recommendations. We talked about, let's get all of the data, the numbers, ridership and costs um, on the table and um, scrubbed in a way that everybody can um, believe the numbers because that's a problem now is some people don't, don't particularly when it comes to Northwest Rail and Peak Rail. Mm -hmm. um, and we have numbers from the BRT, they probably need to be refreshed uh, from the NAMS study, um, which was completed in 2014. <coughs> and we ha have this parallel front range passenger rail, which creates new opportunity for Northwest Rail that didn't exist before. New partnerships, a much bigger geography of, of connection. So I think we should continue and encourage the, the front range passenger rail opportunity, study Northwest Rail thoroughly, and then have uh, ask RTD and the region to have a discussion about going forward and what makes sense. Looking at some of those data points that you brought up, I would caution this committee to prejudge the outcome of that regional conversation. So while I appreciate that you've come to the conclusion that BRT um, would make better sense of Northwest Rail, and I certainly am a fan of BRT, I, I, I think there's some, there's, there's trade-offs, there's historical um, um, commitments, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of um, discussion that needs to happen in the region about if you have to wait for Northwest Rail and it's gonna cost this much, should we do something else? You know, I, in my recent conversation with the governor about this, he said, you know, we should figure out how much RTD owes the Northwest Corridor based on the 2004 fast tracks and have that money set aside and let the corridor basically decide how they wanna use that, um, you know, to invest in front range passenger rail, Northwest, the, the Northwest rail piece of it, or if it's something else. Um, so I think we can include the, the, that, those process steps in our recommendations, um, but I don't wanna, again, have this committee prejudge the outcome of what that conversation should be. We can provide data, but I don't think we can recommend the outcome. Well, let's look at what that recommendation actually says. Okay, if you, if you look at the title of that recommendation, if I can get back to that somehow, it, it is basically that we pursue uh, restoring, for example, the BRT that we had, uh, and, but at the same time, look at other BRT opportunities, but at the same time, continue to look at Northwest Rail and work with those groups. It doesn't, it doesn't say let's drop Northwest Rail at all. It says, you know, here, here is the situation. I'm pretty sure Northwest Rail's gonna take a while. And so can we afford to wait 15 years, 10 years, 20 years? Um, there's a lot that has to happen before Northwest Rail, before they have that ribbon cutting ceremony. And so rather than, my fear is that if we if we don't do anything between now and then, we're going to have a situation where a lot of people that need transit are going to be able to get it. If they and I don't think you and I are very far apart on on the notion of yes, let's move full steam ahead. And, and indeed, that's what Nam said we we're going to do. The full steam ahead part hasn't been as we need more money, um, and so. I certainly support a recommendation from this group to say, yes, we need to move faster on this. And, and the, the federal infrastructure plan, I think provides an opportunity there. I just wanted to be crystal clear that I don't think our, um, 
I, I wouldn't want anybody to misinterpret what you were saying. And I appreciate the, the, the uh, um, emphasis that you've, you've put on clarifying they're both moving forward at the same time. And this, you know, the, look at the wording of the recommendation here. Go ahead and, and wordsmith that for me if, you, if you'd like to, to make that clearer. Because it's certainly something, you know, I, I, I don't rule out Northwest Rail. I just don't see how to get there. And I, my fear is it's going to take a long time. I think we got to be doing something while, while we're waiting. And that's something, uh, an expansion of BRT, not just along the US 36 corridor, but also, of course, to, uh, to Longmont, but also to some of those, you know, to Louisville and, and, uh, and those other communities, Lafayette inside, to be able to easily link into that. So Rod, this is Ron, how is, I, just looking at sort of the draft recommendation for feedback that was in the last meeting and again in this agenda packet that uh, I think says what you're advocating for. Uh, the last bullet there where it says, um, work to implement bus rapid transit projects in the Northwest region as identified in the regional transportation plan. So I'm not, so does that capture what your recommendation, the essence of what your recommendation is getting at? While pursuing the development of Northwest Rail. I think it does, but Elise, are you comfortable with that wording? Um, that the last bullet that Ron just highlighted or yours? Uh, the last bullet that Ron's got up here. Recommendation, given the operational, economic, political, and environmental complexity and risk of completing Northwest Rail, RTD should consider a rapid BRT expansion while pursuing the development of Northwest Rail. What? If I'm going to wordsmith, I, I want to say we are working on BRT now. So there should not be should consider. We should just do it, that RTD should move, pursue well, rapid BRT should expansion. Consider, they should move forward with the rapid yeah. BRT expansion. I would say I would add timing to your list of concerns. And I would also say that we need to move forward with BRT regardless. Um, which is what we're doing. And that was the agreement of all the unanimous agreement in the NAMS um, study that all communities signed on to. So. Yeah, okay. I, well, I see Lynn has her hand up, so. Ed timing in is one of the, one of the issues and, and not, you know, I had a little waffle language in there, I guess, should consider, should pursue a rapid BRT expansion. Let's not mince words about that. I think Lynn wants to say something. Thanks. I know uh, she wants to, I'm wondering if she will. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, you know, it's, it's my area too. And um, right. uh, thanks so much for all your hard work, Rhett. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with, with uh, Elisa's points, I think that that um, the staff has really moved the design study forward, the update of the 30% design study, but um, the board is leaning towards the, the middle choice that, that you were showing the five to 8 million. And that really needs to move forward. You know, it, it, this looks at Northwest Rail as a single piece. And, um, you know, right now we have front range passenger rail, we have Amtrak with potential funding there. Um, it really, those ridership numbers and, and even the cost numbers and some of those things uh, could be changing if some of those thing, things are going through. It, it gets uh, bigger numbers and they need to be updated. And uh, um, then once we get there and see whether those other projects are moving forward, I think I agree with, with uh, Elise, it's, it's time for a conversation with the Carter and, and uh, with the region as to what next steps may be. Um, I'm always a fan of BRT. I think, it's, uh, I think it's great. I think that the NAM study looks at a, a number of other things. I think Highway 119 BRT, which is the only real capital project uh, planned for you know, funding. Near -term. 
couple of years by RTD will make a big difference coming into Boulder. Um, it doesn't solve all the problems uh, of Longmont getting into Denver, um, but there are, you know, there are other considerations there. And then I think there's a, an economic consideration where uh, some of these cities along the way, Louisville, Lafayette, um, Boulder, um, and others are, uh, have made big economic uh, development investments, Broomfield, um, based on the train. So there, there are different conversations to be had, but um, I guess what I would say is right now, um, you know, I fully support seeing what we can do with front range passenger rail and, and Amtrak. And um, I don't really have any problem with the draft recommendations that um, are included here. Uh, Good, Thank thanks. You. Yeah, and you know, it, it, it strikes me as interesting that after all this work, I basically come back to that NAM study. You know, I, I'm a fan of the BRT side, but at the same time, there's no reason not to continue to pursue the Northwest Rail side. You just never know when that blue bird of happiness may light. So let's hope, but let's work while we hope. Because <laughs> we got a lot of people to move along this corridor. Other comments, questions, please. Rebecca. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm a little lost. Are we, I'm pretty comfortable with, uh, I'm looking at the kind of the word document that Ron has up with five recommendations. And the last two seem to together get at both continuing analysis on Northwest Rail and advancing BRT. I just want to make sure that that's what we're moving forward versus the the slide text in the on the blue. Because well, I, I think we're going back and forth. This, this yeah, we are. And Remember some of that stuff I wrote earlier, and this is this is uh, somewhat different. It keeps evolving, you know. I've, I think I've had this three times in our in our meeting, uh, which I think is just one time we've never got to it. But um, I, you know, I, I I will say that none of this is cast in stone. The other thing is this is a recommendation RTD. This is not. RTD, this is what you have to do. Uh, but we will want to hear back from RTD on what is inaccurate. You know, if you can find things in this that, that are wrong, I would love to hear that. You know, I, I, I want it to be the best that we can make it to the benefit of all the people that use this resource. That's a lot of people on, you know, between Longmont and Boulder and not just Boulder and Denver, but all the communities of that whole Northwest corridor. And I haven't spent as much time figuring out how to get uh, good transportation into all those corridors. Although I was interested to see that there is at least one of those uh, that was uh, the Bolt Line, I think it is, that goes across on uh, South Boulder Road. And uh, that's got, at the end of it, it's got some loops into neighborhoods that looks a lot like that stuff that I've been working on, on, on free lift. So anyway, I digress. So Rod, are you suggesting that your slide recommendation replace the last two bullets? No, no? Uh, this, okay. I think the last two bullets are basically sort of, he, here is why it's important uh, that we, uh, that we go ahead and aggressively pursue uh, BRT. If you look at the economics in, in, in the Northwest Rail, I, I just don't know how we get there, but maybe there's enough grant money somewhere that we do get there. And maybe it's partnerships with Boulder County and, and Longmont and things like that. Um, uh, there, are a lot, there are a lot of people in our committee and I'm sure there's plenty of good ideas. And there are a lot of people in RTD with good ideas. So. I think in the end, this is going to be something with, that you have a bigger discussion with all of the communities, and you try to find out what we can, what we can do now, and, and what we need to continue to feed and try to grow. 
I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> I'm not sure which two points there were. Weren't there six points in the slideshow? I'm looking at our uh, draft recommendations for feedback, I think from our agenda packet. Mm, okay. I well, think Ron has it up here. I'll have to try to look and consolidate some of that stuff. Uh, you know, I've been trying to get the slideshow out after I tried to go through and pretend I was gonna discuss it with everybody without slides. And so up until about 10 minutes before this meeting started, that was all I was doing. So. I'll, so I, I, um, I, think, I think my role here is scribe and trying to sort of consolidate and capture a lot of different ideas from the conversations that I've heard and to try to keep you all on task to complete your work on time. Right. And so I'm going to, I'm going to nudge a little bit. Go and, ahead and get me off the stage. I since like you that. have one, one more subcommittee meeting left um, to, to get all the recommendations kind of buttoned up at least in draft form to go to the full committee for consideration and get through equity analysis. There's a lot of work left to do. And I guess Rhett, what I'm seeing all the work you've done I, it sounds like your slideshow boils down to this this recommendation slide that I've that I've got up side by side with sort of the draft recommendation that has that captures lots of different ideas and conversations that I've heard um, from all of the subcommittee members. And so, if I I would respectively suggest that you know let's start editing on one document and, and get a set of recommendations um, together. And I and again, I the last bullet of the draft recommendation for feedback uh, from the agenda packet, I think captures what you're getting at around BRT. And if there's some refinement to the language in that bullet, um, maybe that's a maybe that's a place to focus. I well, think that's I think what Rebecca was asking. I think we had support on the language in this bullet, but I would like to ask, like to add timing in here to the complexity and risk, you know, where it goes across economic, political, comma, timing and environmental complexity and risk of completing Northwest Rail and change the term while pursuing to, uh, oh, should consider, should pursue a rapid BRT expansion. Elise? Sure, I think we're trying to, I don't know if we're supplanting the, the Ron bullet in the other page or merging it, but maybe we can have that happen. I also, <laughs> The two parts of the report now, they're, they're, they're appendices, A and, you know, there are two of those. And then there's a, a front part in the longer report. I wouldn't want to just have this as the recommendation because then there's, there's no meat on the bones. I want, I want RTTD to be able to look at those six or seven items, whatever it is, and say, no, this one's wrong or this one's right. Or uh, I, I feel like that needs to be part of this. Recommendation. Well, I guess it, if we want to include your presentation as an appendices, that's that's one option. But I still think the all of the recommendations should be in one place in the body of the report, so that you know even if they're repeated, we should have all the recommendations in one place. So I guess you you and Ron need to to, to consolidate this into a single set of recommendations um, that will go in the body of the report. Okay. Um, I'll, I also I'll had a question. About this... that. There are other recommendations that we, we have been uh, discussing. There was five or six of those. Okay. I, I do have like, a We prefer the Northwest orientation uh, for the main. Yeah, I think those are all in these bullet points under the draft recommendation. And it, I mean, it, uh, 
I would love to hear from subcommittee members. Is there are there disagreements about sort of the the recommendation statements in the first four of the bullets in the agenda packet? Do those do those seem okay to the subcommittee? I had a couple of comments. I assume just for clarity's sake, at, on the first bullet, the Northwest Rail BNSF alignment, just to be everybody is crystal clear what that means. Okay. Um, the, uh, the third bullet, I would reword that to say, look for investigate opportunities to increase um, resources for stations, including th the list. But I'm not a huge fan of TIF, for example, but mm -hmm. sure, take a look at it. But those aren't the only three that should be looked at. There could be, you know, grants and sure. whatever. Yeah. So, um, and then my last, my last comment had to do with, I think it's worthwhile to reference the 2014 NAM study because it was unanimously adopted by all of the communities in the Northwest mm -hmm. Corridor. And that is what, Form the basis of the the um, 2050 RTP projects. I would list them both, just sort of to give some sort of historical reference to that. Unless you see some problem with that, Ron. I, I don't see a I don't see a problem, Elise. I think the RTP has the most sort of legal standing at this point in terms of regional priorities, but I, I think a reference to NAMS would be fine too. Yeah, I, I, I'm fine with that being the legal thing. I just thought it was useful to provide some historical reference that these were first embraced by the, the communities in, in 2014 and then included in the 2050 RTP. Mm -hmm. and I, it's, a, it's a minor point. It's, I don't think it's a minor point. You know, I. I don't want to in any way in what we're doing here give the impression that, oh, we figured all this out and here's how it should work. A lot of this is, is based on, on that very work, that 2014 NAMS report. There's a little more detail in here. Things have changed some, but basically it's, it's a reflection of that. I think they were right on. And I sure appreciate everyone's willingness to, to look at and talk about such a complicated subject. I wonder if since we're at time, if, if maybe this ball does go back and Ron and Rutt's court and we just absolutely have to leave our next meeting uh, having okay. these nailed down. I, I think what, we, what we'll do is, is Ron and I will work together to try to get the language of all this uh, in a way that we, we think fits what we've heard here. And then we'll send it out to all the committee members. Okay. That sound good? That'd be great. Good. And it's time. Any other last comments from anyone before I adjourn? Thanks for all the effort you put into this rut. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's been wonderful. <laughs> Good work, Rand. <laughs> I never knew that I would spend this much time on this committee. <laughs> Fantastic work. Yet. We appreciate your time. You Thanks. bet. Thanks. Could, could we Thank uh, you, start the next meeting out just by uh, running through our original to-do list? I, I'm going to admit I've lost track of what we uh, um, signed up to do and deliver. Are you talking about the next meeting in two weeks? Mm -hmm. Okay. We still got that. Uh, it should be always appended to the end of the agenda. Yeah. But okay. it's not updated necessarily, regular. Rebecca, you and I are on the hook to uh, revise our spending recommendations and submit that to, to uh, RUT. So maybe you and I can set a date to do that. Oh, for the third allotment of stimulus? Yep. That's right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing further, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Congrats.